Well, thanks for coming. My name is Matt. Um, I'm a BYU student studying computer science, and I'll be graduating here pretty soon. Um, and uh, I've been doing a lot of JavaScript coding over the last few years, and lately I've been doing a lot of Go as well. Uh, and you can see some of my stuff on GitHub if you're interested. But today, um, I thought it would be really interesting to talk about something that I worked on at my last job, which was um, we needed basically to do some high performance file processing in the browser, hence the name of, this, of these slides. And um, so basically, we're going to talk about pushing the browser to its limits um, to the point where maybe it'll crash or you run out of memory. And we're going to talk about how to do this effectively. And as a case study, <clears throat> I'm going to be talking about a project I worked on called Papa Parse, which is a CSV parser. And it's really boring, I know. Um, but I'm going to try and make it interesting here with the technical aspect. Um, Papa Parse started as the, the jQuery Parse plugin, like way back when jQuery plugins were cool. And I did that, even though it didn't use jQuery, obviously, it's a CSV parser. I did that to um, try and, and kind of garnish some, uh, garner some publicity. Everyone was searching for jQuery plugins. It was a good way to get the name out there and whatever. Well, I dropped that whole jQuery dependency in 2014, and then uh, as our needs expanded um, at work, Papa Parse was born, and, uh, and it was able to do some really cool things in the browser that would normally crash the browser. Um, and this is a project, again, that I did on the side, but used it at work. It turned out to be really useful, so I hope you'll find something useful as well. So when we talk about high performance, you know, everyone throws this word out there. And this is how the quote goes, right? <laughs> um, everyone throws that word out there, and you kind of roll your eyes and get tired of it. Um, and, and everyone means different things. But I think let's talk about specifically what we mean here by high performance. Um, when we talk about performance, obviously the first thing that comes to our mind is fast. You want something that is quick and doesn't keep the user waiting. Um, Another aspect that's important to consider is what the user perceives of performance, and that is that you need to keep the page reactive. If your uh, web page is locking up, even if it's working, the, the user is going to think that it's broken and not performing well. Three and four are kind of related. Um, if you run out of memory, you'll crash the tab, the browser tab. And then finally, when we talk about performance, you want it to, to perform well horizontally as well and, and scale out. And Papa Parse, kind of one by one, we tackled each of these. And, um, and I think it actually does a, a pretty good job at demonstrating each of these principles, which is why I'm going to kind of use it as a, a case study. Um, so the, the first thing I want to talk about is, is the scalability thing, because I think this is probably the most obvious. If you have a bunch of Server-side code, uh, and this is what we did at, at my last job. We had um, dozens of .NET Windows servers running. And uh, if they were causing our company, they were costing our company thousands of dollars per month um, to, to run this infrastructure. And it was also the cause of a lot of headaches, because it was kind of a legacy code base. and so. I kind of decided to play around with rewriting this file processing that we did. Our customers would send us files, and we would process them and give them an output file. And uh, so we experimented with moving this to the client. And so I took Papa Parse, and I slapped 1,000 lines of JavaScript on top of it, and essentially replaced our entire .NET code base that was costing us a lot of money. And this works really well. So if you want to scale your application massively to the number of users you have, then just offload all the processing to the client. Have everyone download their own copy of the code and, and run it in their browser. This works really well when the job ratio is about one to one, when every customer, every client has about one job to perform. It's, uh, it turns out it's actually quite secure. It's nearly impossible to attack it with a, a DOS or some sort of botnet because, again, it, you've scaled it out to your thousands of users, and they're not all running servers, and they can't all be attacked. Another nice side effect of this um, was that users no longer had to upload their files to us. And so this was really effective in corporate and enterprise relationships where they, 
you know, because of policies or laws, weren't allowed to let the data leave their intranet. And so um, by downloading the processing code to the client side and executing it there, um, we were able to bypass a lot of corporate restrictions and um, ultimately, again, it saved us a lot of money. And it, it, and it made our highest paying customers happier. So um, for the rest of this, I'm going to talk about these things. I um, already have kind of addressed the scaling issue. I hope that was obvious. Is there any questions about that before I move on? OK. Um, it may not be as hard to do as you think, depending on your app. It's worth taking a look at. Um, I actually just came from a talk earlier about a kind of a massively distributed persistent data store that's all in clients and doesn't have like a central server running it. That was really cool. I'm a huge fan of that idea. So the rest of this talk, we'll just look at a few of these aspects. And if you have questions, feel free to, or comments, feel free to raise your hands. This is a pretty small room, so I think we can be pretty interactive. So the first thing that you're going to have to do if you're processing files or using them as input is you're going to need to read them from the file system. And this is pretty easy if you're familiar with XML HTTP requests. Hopefully we all have done bare bones AJAX requests before. Um, pretty simple pattern. First you have to obtain a, um, first you have to obtain a, a handle on the file. And because of security restrictions, you can't just um, you can't just specify a file path and load a file from the file system. The user has to deliberately drag and drop a file or select it in a file input box. Once you have that file, you can just create a new file reader, give it a callback. Through the event passed into the callback, you can read the text from the file, and then you call read as text, which is an asynchronous call. Well, this doesn't work very well if the file is large. Uh, at least this is what happened a few months ago um, in Chrome, is the tab would crash. And this is unfortunate because some of our customers would send us files that were 100 megabytes. You know, that's not huge, but it's enough to, to crash most browsers. Um, so we're going to look at a technique that will allow you to process files that are multiple gigabytes in size um, right in the browser. And this actually, oh, so this is what happens nowadays. I tested this this week again, and it's different. So Chrome now handles large files um, by succeeding, kind of. It doesn't throw an error. It, guess, it gives up after about four seconds. And as you can see, there was no row. This was the pop-up parse demo on the website. Um, there was no rows here of data. So it found out after about four seconds that the file was too big and gave up and gave my code an empty text content. Um, too bad. So Firefox was nice enough to at least tell me there was an error and that it was trying to allocate too much space. And Safari chewed through the whole file. Uh, this is about a gigabyte input file. And it took about 15 minutes and locked up my entire browser <laughs> and <laughs> broke the name of the tab because I don't know why it's doing the file protocol there. It was actually on a domain. And it used up all my memory and swapped out about 15 gigs of stuff. <laughs> but it worked. We want to avoid all of this. <laughs> you can do it, but we want to avoid this and do it better. So how do you do this with large files? Well, there's a little trick. If you know HTML5 API, you're getting familiar with that. You know there's a blob interface, which is really handy with binary data, typically. But files also inherit from the blob interface. So you can slice blobs. You can say, I want this start and this end in the blob and, and get that. So you can also do this with files. And it's really easy. You just call file.slice, again, on your file handle. Give it the start byte and the end byte that you want. And then you read as text that chunk or that part of the file. And uh, the browser will only load that part of the file. So this gives you a part of the file. But how do you get the whole thing? Well, naturally, you loop through the whole file chunk by chunk. So you specify a chunk size, and you loop through it, and you call read as text each time. And it's a fairly simple method. And if you're familiar with streaming at all, this is basically what you're doing, is you're um, making a buffer and filling it up with a different part of the file each time. Now, just so you know, read as text is asynchronous. So this particular loop I'm only using for illustration. Don't actually do this in your code, because the for loop will finish before the first chunk of the file is even finished being read. And so you'll end up loading the whole file at once anyway. 
So you'll want to utilize callbacks, and after you're done in a callback, then you load the next chunk of the file. But this is the basic idea. Um, so there's a few things to consider here with this. One is the chunk size, um, and this varies widely depending on your application. You're going to want to do some experimenting and see um, maybe what kind of hardware most of your clients are using. Solid state drive versus mechanical drive matters. Um, and it matters too if you're downloading this file over the internet, which we'll actually talk about in a bit, or if it is local on the file system. But just that optimal chunk size is trial and error. I wouldn't do one larger than 20 or 30 megabytes. I think pop-up parse defaults to 10, uh, which is a pretty safe bet. Um, another issue is broken lines. When you break a file into pieces, the chances that you're going to end a chunk at precisely the end of a unit of data or whatever, in CSV's case, it'd be the end of a row, is very unlikely. So you probably, in, in Papa Parse, we always assume that when you load a chunk that you've broken up a row of data at the very end, that that last row is not complete. So what we have to do is we have to buffer that row, and the next time we load the next chunk, we take the first line of that new chunk and append it on to what we had before to kind of patch it back together. Your data format may vary. You have to consider this. Um, but again, it, it can work. Um, Cross-browser issues are a concern. Even in 2015, slicing a file is not consistent. At least it wasn't a few months ago. Um, and another thing to consider is synchronous versus asynchronous operations, which I'm going to go into a little more detail here in just a moment. Um, something to consider, too, is handling errors. Basically, that loop that we just looked at, if there's an error, you may want to abort it because you can't continue reading and processing any more of the file. Or depending on your operations or, or whatever you're trying to do, maybe you can load the rest of the file if one chunk fails to load. Maybe it's a temporary glitch in the hardware or the file system that resolves itself within the next few seconds and the next chunk loads successfully. Uh, you, de you decide what to do, but you've got to handle that case. Um, the file may be deleted while you're loading it. Uh, permissions errors, you've got to consider it all. Someone may yank the flash drive out. I don't know. Um, and then finally, something that I didn't initially anticipate was pausing and resuming this process. When you're doing a large file that maybe takes 20 or 30 minutes to process, I mean, that's huge, but again, it depends. Then users may want to pause the process and come back later. I don't know why, but we had users asking for that. And also, if you're making AJAX requests or doing other asynchronous things, uh, it can be useful to pause the process and then finish um, loading the file piecewise where you left off. Um, so the next issue about performance is keeping the page responsive. So now we, we know how to keep the tab alive. We know how to limit memory usage here. Um, but when we are doing the actual processing, when we are going through all that data we just loaded in this new chunk, it, uh, it locks up the page, right? Because JavaScript is single-threaded. And that's a problem because typically the solution would be, well, you run the script in another thread, and then the operating system will interleave the activities and keep your applications responsive. And, and that's really great, but in JavaScript, you, you can't really do that. Um, so it's, it's true. JavaScript is single-threaded, but there is actually a little trick in browsers um, in the HTML5 API, there's something called web workers. And you may not have used these before. Um, they've been around a while, and their new counterpart is service workers. Um, but web workers are actually uh, a facility provided by the, um, by the web browser to help you get some multi-threaded capabilities in a way. So even though JavaScript is single-threaded and it's it's, we're not breaking this fact. All of the asynchronous operations are still hidden from us in the runtime. All of the AJAX calls and file loading and, and things like that that require a callback, they still require callbacks. Um, and we can't access the threads that the runtime uses. But the browser does give us these web workers, which are true genuine system threads, that if we execute a web worker, we can keep our main page alive and responsive. But 
this thread, in my opinion, it kind of violates the whole idea of a thread, which is that threads share memory with the parent process. So these web workers are actually executed in a completely separate context, and they don't share any memory with your script. And this was my reaction when I learned about this. My hair is shorter, though. Um, and so nevertheless, I, I trudged on, and, and I figured out what we could do here. And, and so web worker is actually really easy to use. You just pass in the, fi uh, the file name of a JavaScript uh, file, and then it will start executing immediately in a separate thread. And then when you're done, you just call terminate if you want to kill it early. Um, but then the question is, well, how do you synchronize or coordinate the tasks between your main thread and the web worker? And the answer is you have to pass messages. So that's how you communicate. Um, and this is an asynchronous action. Uh, ascend is, uh, is asynchronous. But it can be used to give the worker thread a task to do, and it can be used to relay the results back to the main thread. Well, there's a problem, though. Um, like I said, threads don't share memory in JavaScript in browsers. So um, it's, you have to deal with this fact, which means that every message that you send is a copy. And you don't have access to the DOM in a web worker. And you also don't have access to the main threads, files, or sorry, variables or functions, which means that the web worker is kind of on its own. Even if a web worker does produce a whole bunch of useful results, if you want to put that in the DOM or back in the main thread, you have to copy it all back to the main thread. You can't just transfer ownership, with one exception being the array buffer, which is a raw uh, binary array. Um, and in that case, you can actually send an array buffer to a main thread or a worker thread. It's a blocking operation. When it's done, the thread who just sent that away, array buffer away can no longer read uh, the contents. It basically becomes undefined. It transfers the ownership or the visibility. But um, anyways, if you're working with binary data, I highly recommend using that feature. Inside a web worker, though, you can use something uh, that's kind of cool. It's a synchronous file reader. So you can call read as text and actually get the results returned to you uh, directly. It's a blocking call. Obviously, that would not be acceptable in a main thread because it blocks up the page. So here's, um, here's a timeline of how long it took a single thread to execute. Um, or this is, so this is, uh, this is parsing a CSV file with about 5 million rows using Papa Parse and just its main thread. So it took about 11 seconds, and the browser did lock up during this time. The page was unresponsive for the most part. But it, uh, it was able to do the job fairly quickly and um, performed about as you would expect. When I ran the same code in a web worker, I was surprised by the results. As you, this is the same file, um, and it took 200 seconds. This is about over 10 times as long. And I could not figure out for the longest time why after 30 seconds, the performance of the web worker decreased drastically. So the jagged lines at the beginning I actually, these are anticipated because, again, remember how I said there's a copy? So the web worker is to finish parsing all the CSV data, and then to send it back to the main thread, it involves a file copy, or a, a data copy. And so that's what the jagged line is being caused by. But at 30 seconds, there's no reason that it should be slowing down and take uh, about 20 sec or 50 seconds to, to process the next chunk. And then, what is that, 60 to? And then another like 70 seconds to process the next chunk. And it keeps getting longer. And I thought, I mean, I don't know. Any guesses as to what's happening? It's OK to be wrong or anything. But so I had no idea. I thought maybe the browser was throttling a web worker, is using too much CPU. And I thought that's kind of ridiculous. That's the point of web workers, is to use CPU. Um, but then the. Uh, some smart fellow on Google Plus, of all places, suggested that it was um, garbage collection wasn't having a chance to run because the synchronous file reader in a web worker was never dequeuing any events from the event loop, including garbage collection. So again, here's a comparison of the asynchronous file reader in blue and the synchronous file reader in red. And 
initially, again, I thought it was a consequence of using web workers that was causing this performance decrease, but it was actually using the synchronous file reader. So I learned this is probably not what you want in long running scripts, even though in theory the synchronous file reader is supposed to be faster. <clears throat> um, at this point, I would do a live demo, but I'll let you do it on your own computers if you want. There's even sample files at popaparse.com. You can kind of have some fun. There's not any huge files, but if you want some, just follow me on Twitter. Maybe I'll link you to a sample, like huge CSV file. So um, the next thing that was really annoying about <laughs> writing this really high performance library was browser quirks. Um, the next requirement that we had was to be able to download a file remotely, a huge file, and process it. And this is kind of its own beast. So instead of using the file reader, we're using Ajax requests. And we had to download this file in chunks. And there was a Chrome bug at the time. And I think it's still at large. I actually haven't checked recently. This was a few months ago. But basically, the dev tools showed one thing, but JavaScript saw another thing from the same response headers. So I was looking in the dev tools at the bottom of the screen <coughs> at some value for a header, but JavaScript was telling me something else. And um, it just really complicated things. Worked great in Firefox, by the way. So, and then there's also the little caveat that servers have to support a content range header, which, for example, Python's simple HTTP server does not. Um, I won't go into a whole lot of detail about this because this is not a debugging session, but you can kind of look at this when I post the slides later about um, how the first chunk of a file worked fine and the response headers for the last chunk um, at the end of the file were as expected, but JavaScript was getting the wrong <coughs> information from the XML HTTP request. Um, the content range header was completely wacko. As you can see in the response, it says that it um, sent more of the file than existed. <laughs> and the response, ten response text length was about um, two megabytes, but the response header said that the content length was about five megabytes. And so anyway, this made it really tricky to do this. But and it worked OK in Firefox. As you can see, the response text length should be the same as the content length. And the range header uh, had the correct values. Anyways, your application may vary. But just expect to run into bugs when you're pushing the browser to its limits. You're going to be doing some weird things and seeing some weird behavior. OK, the last thing I want to go over really quick. How much time do I have left? Anyone keeping track? 10 minutes? That's plenty of time. OK, so the last thing that we can look at here is um, if you want to write high performance code, or if you want a high performance application, write high performance code. Um, I know these lines are small. I'm sorry. But this is a comparison of the different processing times for a CSV file on, on JSPerf. For, uh, for these various different libraries, including two versions of Papa Parse. So the blue line here is Papa Parse 3.1. And this is when we first, when I first released the, um, the, the chunking and streaming functionality that allowed you to process huge files. I never went back and revisited the original algorithm. So even though I was adding all of these nice like cherries on top and kind of the icing on the cake, right? Um, I never actually went back and, and looked at what was causing it to be really slow, which was the, the base algorithm, the, the fundamental core of the, of the library. And that was a mistake, um, because all these other CSV libraries in orange, green, and purple, for example, were very fast, just an order of magnitude faster. And um, so I went back and revisited this for Papa Parse 4, and I probably learned about at least a dozen different ways to parse CSV files. And it's not just a string dot split. Uh, usually. And so by using, so initially, I guess if, if you're interested, Papa Parse 3, what it was doing is it was reading it character by character and kind of doing lexical analysis and you know the traditional way of like parsing stuff. And that's actually really slow in JavaScript because of all the allocations. You don't have a whole lot of control over the memory management. And uh, so it really slows things down. Um, 
Papa Parse 4, uh, I use a technique similar to the, the library in yellow, the Henix library, where we do indexing for certain characters, and then we do substrings and make a complete copy of entire substrings at a time. Much, much, much faster. And so by completely just reinventing the core algorithm of this library, the, the speed increased tenfold or more. And it's still, I'm pretty sure, the fastest CSV parser out there that's actually correct in, in all the edge cases. Notice, too, that Chrome uh, and Firefox are significantly different. Firefox is faster in its handling of strings. It actually, so I have a link here to a page about the way that Firefox handles strings. It's much improved. So if you have a very string-heavy application, uh, Firefox is actually better at uh, managing those and allocating memory and stuff than Chrome is. And so you might suggest to your users to use Firefox. Don't require it, of course. This is 2015, after all. But just recommend it. It's just <laughs> faster. Um, so now here's, here's a kind of a cool edge case. I said that string.split is never the right way to parse CSV file. And that's only true in most cases. Sometimes, if a CSV file really doesn't have delimiters in the data, or new lines, or um, uh, just weird characters, or the delimiter itself in the data, then you can actually call string.split and get away with it. This is really useful in scientific applications where the data is all numeric, or maybe some business applications where it's just metrics and stuff. Um, so Papa Parse 4 has a fast mode, which is the orange line, compared to the red line, which is Papa Parse without fast mode. And the fast mode is no magic. It's just string.split on the delimiter. And um, it's blazing fast. It's super easy to, to detect if a file needs it. And if it does, or if it can use it, then it does. And it just, anyway, it's just blazing fast. You can't even see the old Papa Parse, the blue line, in comparison. Um, but notice here that in this case, Chrome is much faster than Firefox. So you have to kind of think about these things. So the end result was that Chrome was able to process a, um, a 1 gigabyte or a 912 megabyte CSV file. Uh, in, from three minutes, we got it down to 45 seconds with, without locking up the page, which is really cool. Firefox, we got it down to 30 seconds. And with fast mode, we got it down to less than 20. Um, so that's, that's most of the content. Um, I did get some questions before when I was going through this about creating really big files. So not just reading in the files is one challenge, but how do you actually create an output file that's huge? Um, this table is just for reference. I honestly don't have a good answer for you. If you want to create a really huge file for the user in the browser, um, good luck. <laughs> These are some recommendations for you. Um, you'll probably want to resort to IndexedDB. Um, you, you can use blob types, so binary data works really well. You can concatenate them. The only problem is that you'll have to um, append to strings in memory. So if you have a huge string that would crash in memory, I don't know what to tell you except maybe try compressing it before it gets big. <laughs> so I think that's all I've got. Um, you should follow me on Twitter. And if you're interested in serving your JavaScript from the server faster with HTTP2, then check out my other project, which is a cross-platform HTTP2 server. Um, but anyway, are there any questions? Um, sure. Sorry. I guess I just had one question. Maybe I missed um, So you started using web workers so that the browser would um, but then you mentioned an issue you had with web workers where it wasn't garbage collecting. Oh. So what did you end up doing to get around that? Right. So the question is, uh, I was using web workers, but I, in the graph I showed, web workers were performing poorly. So how did I solve that? Well, the answer is, in the web worker, I also use the asynchronous file reader, just like I do in the main thread. And, it's, and then you get a jagged line that takes about 45 seconds to finish parsing, but it, it doesn't take 200. So in my opinion, never use the synchronous file reader. <laughs> Did you have one? Uh, yeah. Uh, splitting on bytes, do you run into problems with Unicode? 
Yes. So how do you resolve those? If you are doing if you're doing this to yeah. So if you're reading the text, so but the default encoding with, to a call to read as text, the default encoding is is ASCII, I believe, or um, it's UTF eight. If you're um, if you're doing multi-byte encoding stuff, then this may cause a problem. It may split up a character in the middle of the character. Um, and I don't know if I have a good answer to that right now. I've worked with a lot of English majors before who are very addicted to their end dashes. Uh, yeah, so in that case, it's like you're playing a roulette, right? You just kind of hope that it never lands there. <laughs> 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 this is JavaScript, folks. <laughs> Um, yeah, that's a good question. This is not a perfect science, but um, any others? Okay. Well, thank you. I'm happy to answer any questions you have. After you.